Hello and welcome to Making a Monster. This week is an extra special, extra long bonus episode, and it is two and a half years in the making. From the very beginning, I most enjoyed role-playing games when I could somehow flip the script, subvert the rules a little bit. For example, what if the horde of goblins are somehow all the same goblin? Or what if the tiny microbots aren't a self-replicating nightmare catastrophe, but a troop of fun-loving pranksters? Or what if I want to play not just one, but two characters in my next campaign? In 2018, I started playing Dungeons & Dragons with a character option called the Divatee that let me do just that. It's a truly unique character option that was updated from an older edition of the game, and it was the first time I started thinking about how creatures and characters must have changed over the years from edition to edition. So I reached out to the people who made both editions of the Divati that I had found, and I was surprised to find them both willing to chat with me. It was really the earliest version of the Making a Monster podcast, though I clearly didn't know it at the time. Just so you know, the plan for this, I know I'm going to publish a written article on scintilla.studio. If the audio works out, I might release some kind of audio version of this. Don't worry, past Lucas. I'll take it from here. What follows is a conversation between the second edition creator of the Divati, the fifth edition homebrewer who brought it forward a full generation, and me, maybe the only person to have played a long-running campaign while running two characters at once. It's also the first of this season's bonus episodes, and while it's very different from what I usually do, it's a chance to grow the show, to ask questions the regular format can't support. So if you like it, let me know, and if you don't, let me know. For now, well, Well, welcome, guys. Hello. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Yes. Talon, this is Mike. Mike, this is Talon. (laughs) Hello, Mike. (laughs) <laughs> Hi, nice to meet you. I, I'm genuinely thrilled to meet you. I have so many questions I'm gonna I'm gonna bore you and the audience with. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> Talent, would you mm-hmm. go ahead and remind the listener mm-hmm. what you designed that brought you on this particular interview? Well, first off, if nobody's you know heard of me, my name is is Talon Dunning, and I am a, an illustrator and in the RPG business, but I also do a little development writing on the side. And way back when, you know, I don't even remember the date. It was like 99 or somewhere in the late, very, very late 90s. TSR, little little company, no one's ever heard of them, had a contest in Dragon Magazine. And it was uh, Design a Monster. So, you know, we go back even further. And when I was in college at, uh, at Auburn University in, in, in the 90s, I had developed a, uh, a race, mostly for Planescape, because that was my game back in the day. And uh, it was called the Divati, and uh, which was uh, these, they're basically twins. They're, like the, the, the entire premise was that they have one soul, but the soul is too powerful to be ho- to housed in, in one body. So it's, it's separated into, into two, two beings. So every Divati is born an identical twin. And they sort of share their lives together. And, and, and they're almost, it's almost this concept that I think a lot of twins, real twins probably find insulting, <laughs> which is, which is that they're literally the same person, but kind of just divide it up. So it's, it's, it's sort of this very fantasy idealized sort of version of what twins are. And mechanically, this is a race option that allows one player to play two characters. Is mm-hmm. that And that's not how I originally designed it. I had in mind that they would be played by, by, two different people mostly because it, the the idea of playing them as one character never occurred to me that was actually what paizo did that was that was their brilliance of taking what i did and sort of running with it for the uh, the dragon magazine let me bring mike into the call mike mm-hmm. in 2016 you pick up the story so tell everybody who you are and and how you got involved hi i'm mike hollick uh, editor-in-chief of uh, mage hand press yeah ba- around 2016 dnd fifth edition was coming out and it's a really beautiful system, and, and we absolutely fell in love with it. But coming off the heels of 3.5 and Pathfinder, which were just a menagerie of really interesting options, I decided to start a little blog with one of my friends to try to just add some more options, principally for my own players. But you know, I, I suppose it was a public space, so it got a lot of attention eventually. And we wanted to bring some of those options from earlier editions into 5th edition. So we you know, had more, back to that kind of zoo, that menagerie of fun stuff. And, and, and chief among that in 3.5 was a, a book called Dragon Compendium, which had all that stuff from Dragon Mag. And they were some of the 
most wild stuff, sometimes the least balanced, but almost always the most interesting. <laughs> and that's where I first stumbled across it. And I, I fell in love with the Devati. I'm a twin. And oh, awesome. It, yeah, it's one of the reasons I guess it resonates with me. It's extremely interesting to kind of imagine uh, this kind of fantasy take on it. And uh, yeah, I fell in love with it. And nice. it was one, of the, one of the first things I adapted. And weirdly, I'm one of the few people to have adapted it, probably because it's it's mechanically a, a challenging thing to do. But it's a super interesting challenge to write something that lets you play two characters at one time without without breaking everything. So I've adapted that yeah. to fifth edition along with just a, a mountain of other things. And I've written a ton of my own content. And that's a whole other story. How I come in summer 2018, I found Mike's conversion for fifth edition. And I thought it was just the most extra thing I had ever seen. <laughs> And I was about to start playing with some friends who had been who had been in a very long running campaign, and I really wanted to wow them with my character concept. So I went to the dungeon master and I said, "Hey, what about this?" And I will forever love him for saying, "Yeah, sure, let's do it." And I've I've been playing a, a set of Devadi twins ever since. So nice. that's kind of the whole story of how we all three got on the call, yeah. and that's all of the formal stuff that I think we need to cover. I'm going to take the breaks off, you guys. Let's get to know each other for a little while. <laughs> well, first, um, I'll say, Mike, uh, I, I, I am somewhat familiar with your work. I was a backer on uh, Dark Matter. Holy um, cow. Recently, yeah. <laughs> a, 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 a guy I know online uh, actually just started a game. It's his own setting, but he's using Dark Matter as his, as his base. And he's the one who sort of introduced me to it. And I was like, oh, okay, this is cool. So I liked it enough. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to back this. This is, this is very awesome. So, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm currently playing in a Dark Matter game. That's um, amazing. <laughs> and and uh, that last interview that, that Lucas mentioned was when the your version of the Devotee was brought to my attention. I didn't know about it then, and uh, I was I was very excited to see that that somebody had had kind of picked it up and run with it. And I and I like what you did with it. It's 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 simple and playable. Yeah, thank you. It was if you <laughs> if you kind of hold them up side by side, like you can tell I was absolutely mm -hmm. going through and kind of trying to tick all of the boxes that were handled in the the implement mm -hmm. the three point five implementation. There's a lot to yeah. talk about in order to handle it correctly, and I think the only real innovation I I really had to add to it was eh, subheaders. Put some real subheaders in <laughs> yeah. as many places as you can, and it might be mm -hmm. easier to chew on. And you know, mechanically, it ends up being very much in the same spirit, and it mm -hmm. played pretty well, I think. How much? So, how much writing did you end up doing on the original besides the name and the concept? You mentioned Paizo had some some part of that. I wonder. Yeah, tell me about that. Well, my contribution to it was for Two E and for that Dragon Magazine contest, and uh, they they took what I did and and it was a little bit long, so they kind of edited it down so it would all fit on one page. But for the most part, the article that appears in that Dragon Magazine issue, which I'm afraid I do not remember the number of it. I've got several copies, but I can't remember the number. Hold up, I'll check. Because <laughs> that might be, people might want to look that up. I, I actually won a second place or honorable mention or something like that. Was the My prize was a copy of Monstrous uh, Compendium number four or something like that. It's a book. <laughs> it was like a you know $20 value. <laughs> but it was really exciting. It was the first thing I ever had published. I mean, it was the, the very first time that my name appeared in in, in, in print for writing. You know, I had, I had a few arts projects done at that time and, and was just starting my career. But that was the first time I'd ever written anything and, and had my so. But yeah, what what appears in that Dragon Magazine article is pretty much word for word what I wrote, just edited down. The Dragon Compendium, they rewrote it and redid it, and that, that was all them. But it still had my name on it. That was another one where they did not inform me that was happening. I didn't know it, that was in existence until somebody sent me an email and was like, "Hey, there's a discussion about your your race online. Would you?" be interested in in throwing in your two cents and i'm like uh, okay so i went and looked at the at the, at, at the pathfinder or the, you know at the paizo forums and there was this whole huge conversation about this compendium book and i'm like wait what, <laughs> That's what I first heard about it. it was it was the the forums because you know 3.5 mm -hmm. was such a big space and and the, the i mean you, you to people on forums and you there are power builds and fun meme stuff you could do with uh, oh, yeah. you know all the 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 builds there was there was a lot of freedom for that sort of lonely fun that we love about uh dnd &D, right where you can build, <laughs> yeah, build yeah, yeah. complicated ways and do it on your own and yeah. the Devadi always came up as one of those super wild like crazy builds and i and when i read it i just fell in love with the concept they did a fantastic job reinterpreting 
what I had done. Of course, it was it was overly complicated, and the hit point thing was it made them almost unplayable, which was what the entire conversation on online was about. That was the first problem I had to solve. Yeah, and it's it's a difficult problem to solve. I'm actually currently working with someone to work up a Pathfinder version, uh, a new Pathfinder version. And we have encountered a lot of the same problems that I'm sure you did, Mike. And, and re-looking at yours, having, having been working on it for a while, and, and, and I just reviewed yours today, we took very similar approaches to a lot of the same problems, which I liked to see. I was like, yeah, because this, this shows that we're sort of you know working in the same direction and that sort of thing. I'll, I'll say that the version we're working on now, which I, I, I can't publish it because I don't own the rights anymore. I gave that up at the, the contest. But I'm going to publish it for free. It's fan-created stuff. But the, the hit point issue, I actually sort of just took a step back from it and said, the problem is everybody keeps saying, you got one pool that you're splitting between two bodies. I'm like, no, it's one character. You have to approach it as if it were one character. A single character has a single pool of hit points, period. There's there's no splitting. There's no, you know, oh, he one's only got half the hit points and he goes down. No, you got hit points just like anybody else. And if if you if you lose your hit points, you go to zero, your character goes unconscious, both of them, because they're the same person. Certainly. And once I, I kind of landed on that point and I stopped trying to make them two separate people, the, the writing of this new version has become a lot easier. And I think really that's the solution to the hit point problem. It's just they have a pool of hit points, period, just like everybody else. It's certainly the way we handle the action economy for them, we say. Yeah, you basically have the action economy of one character. You're just, you know, some of these actions can be taken over here. Some of them can be taken over there. And that's that's how yeah. you reason it out. If you and The big problem, yeah. to maybe uh, elucidate the problem a little bit, you don't want to create something that feels like you're twice as strong as any other person around the table because mm-hmm. everyone else around Correct. the table will be angry with you. But Incorrect. if you feel yeah. like if you take half the damage of anyone else and then you go down because half of your hit points are in each body then you're so fragile is to be made of glass. right i think in my yeah. version you ended up having around uh 150 percent of the total hit points split across two characters so you're a little more fragile but you can tank a little more if you're extremely balanced in how you tank it so you know yeah uh, you there's ways you can make it work yeah yeah so we're, we're still working on the pathfinder version of course pathfinder is a more complicated system than than 5e by its nature, it's a lot more crunchy, <laughs> which some people love, some people hate. I don't know. So ours is a little bit more in depth and 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 uh, than than the five E version. But I think yours really captures the five E spirit really well and is makes them very playable. So I was I was happy with it. I'd like to try it one day. <laughs> <laughs> that that is extremely high praise. Thank you. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it was Dragon Magazine number two seventy one. Two seventy one. Yes. It was on May. It was in May of two thousand. Okay, so it was about ninety nine then that I that I entered the contest. It was on page eighty one. I know this because I I printed out page eighty one <laughs> behind my character sheet. Nice. I have for the last two years. I haven't referenced it at all. But... It's so fascinating. <laughs> it's so fascinating to learn that this originally came out of a contest because I didn't know that. I assumed you yep. had you had gotten a small writing gig with the Wizards of the Coast at some point. I did some illustrations for the Star Wars role playing game online. They put out a series of articles on their website back when they had D twenty Star Wars, and they hired me to do some portraits for them. That is the only time I've ever gotten a paycheck from them. But yeah, it was it was a contest, uh, and it was you know it was something I had lying around. I had I had created them a long time ago. And still, I think, never really played them. I think I played around with, a, with some character concepts once, but... What was the game like as you were playing it when, you know, back in those old Planescape games when the Devadi first came to be? had a really interesting time, because I was in college, as I said, and uh, we had a group that was almost all Dungeon Masters. So we had like eight or nine different games going at, at once. <laughs> and we would just, everybody would just show up at my house after, after classes and say, well, what are we going to play tonight? You know, and a lot of times we played Torg. We were huge, huge fans of Torg from West End Games. But if everybody was in the mood for D&D, it was either one guy running Dark Sun, or one guy running Forgotten Realms, you know, that sort of thing. And, and Planescape was my world. That was the, you know, everybody said, let's play Planescape. But then I was the guy to run it. So it was, we were real, you know, we didn't do like, like have a night where we would say, okay, this is our game night. We're all going <laughs> to gather. No, it was literally every night. 
what are we going to do tonight? I don't know. What do you feel like playing? I don't know. What do you feel like playing? <laughs> <laughs> and we would end up just kind of landing on something and, and playing for five or six hours. And then, you know, and it was, it was very free form. There were no miniatures. It was all just theater of the mind, and, but it was, it was good times. And uh, I think a friend of mine and I made up a pair of, of Duvati and maybe played them two or three times. And, and of course, as I said, at the time that was supposed to be separated, that was the idea. You played two separate characters. I mean, they could be anything, you know, they weren't really the whole, the same person. They were just more or less traditional twins. It worked okay. It was, you know, it was, it was fun, but we, we moved on. We had so many different other games, so many different, different other character concepts that we didn't play that, that, that set for very long. You know, it's funny that that concept of just play two characters is so strong. I've tried to revisit it. Like after discovering the Devadi in 3.5 and then redoing them for fifth edition, I kind of stumbled on the idea that like, this is a lot for just a race, like complex, you know, in terms of complexity. So mm -hmm. I took that play two characters idea and I poured it into a whole class and it's something that is extremely compelling and always really challenging to pull off and like find ways that feel feel appropriate to do that because it's 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 both mechanically very powerful and really like a fascinating place to take the storytelling. You know, mm -hmm. being able to play not just yourself, yeah. but also one NPC like it, it really brings <laughs> some of the DMing into your hands. And that's kind of neat. Yeah. It, well, you know, and it's it's interesting because a lot of people have, have, have kind of argued this back and forth and was like, oh, it's not fair if you get to play two characters and I only get to play one. And I'm like, well, it's just another character. It's like, who cares who's playing it? You can <laughs> get the, you know, you need five people in the party. I mean, I've had DMs go, we well, don't have enough players. Will, will you play two characters? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, just to get the party up, you know, it's like we everybody wants to play, but darn, we don't have enough players. Everybody play two characters. Now we have. It's not a contest to me it's it's you know it's you're not trying to be better than the guy next to you you're you're trying to help that guy so play two characters it doesn't matter it doesn't doesn't affect the game you know that, at least that's the kind of approach i tend to take with, with things like that that's such a fascinating approach <laughs> yeah but that all being said i really love the idea of the one character split into two bodies and how that changes the dynamic of play yeah, let's come to that. Mike, I wonder when you were putting your conversion together, did you do any play testing with this? Only a little bit. We got out one or two sessions. I don't, which is actually funny because a lot of the stuff I put out that is not a full base class or, you know, a, a big printed supplement, it doesn't often get a lot of play testing. Like it's a lot of theory crafting and that mm -hmm. kind of comes down to actually my philosophy on play testing, which is it's not actually there to identify mechanical issues. You should be able to do that with math and spreadsheets and and hard work <laughs> yep. you have to wait until someone rolls dice for this to realize that something's broken you've done something wrong play testing is in order to identify if the alchemy of fun has happened Ooh, um, i like that term <laughs> yeah well yeah fun is an alchemy it's not science you can make something that is perfectly balanced and is really cool and then just isn't fun to play and sometimes you can put something together that's kind of simple kind of straightforward and is a blast because of one little thing you added in there and i have so many yeah. stories about that from from my you know admittedly not huge career I, you know i've been designing for five years now but, you know, it, it's an alchemy. So that's what that's what the playtesting is for. And once I just, you know, discovered like, oh, yeah, this is fun. After a couple of one shots, you know, we moved on and kept playtesting other stuff. Yeah, I was going to say you, you you sort of write from a from a DM's point of view. Although I think we playtested it in Planescape. Oh, nice. I'm almost certain we did it with my buddy's Planescape campaign, the one where he uh, went to the Outlands and eventually the, the first two circles of hell. So, well, that's fantastic. Yeah, it was, yeah, what a wild coincidence. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I had no idea you built it for Planescape. Well, you know, what's interesting is that, that my original design, I mean, at least the original idea, I didn't have Planescape in mind specifically, but that's just what we were playing a lot of at the time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and when it came down to the contest, and I was like, well, I got to make them from somewhere. I'll just make them from the Outlands, you know? And, and I kind of thought about it. What if this is sort of the one of the dominant races on the Outlands? This is a mortal race that lives in plains for no apparent reason. You know? <laughs> and I kind of liked that idea, so I just sort of ran with it. I think I just envisioned mine when I went back to the writing on it. I wanted to simplify it out, and I just said, yeah, they're like twins. They're like special twins, because there's fraternal twins, mm -hmm. which are more common than identical twins, and then there's Devati, right. which are more common than identical twins, or, uh, you know, more uncommon. Uh, and I thought, yeah. you know, to me, that, that really spoke to just, you know, what it's like to be a twin. You're just kind of born that way. And it's just part of your family, <laughs> and it's how you are. Yeah, I yeah. I'm glad we got to this, because I'm looking at this art from Dragon Magazine, and this is, this is bonkers. I did not draw that, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, wash your hands of this. I'm just going to quote from this because why not? Okay, go for it. Divati appear elven due to their slight build, but the resemblance ends there. They have snow white skin, thick black hair that is rather difficult to cut, and solid blue eyes that seem to lack irises or pupils. Their noses are almost non-existent, having only a pair of small slitted nostrils that protrude slightly from the face. Their shapely and graceful hands have but three fingers and a thumb. Yep. It, it's pretty <laughs> wild, huh? Yeah. It's... <laughs> I don't know how to, like, grapple with that when the appeal is clearly twins play two characters. And in that way, if you want that appeal to land, make it relatable, make it human. Well, I will tell you the, where, where the, uh, the inspiration for their look came from. Are any of you familiar with an artist named Patrick Nagel? Not off the top of my head. I guarantee you've seen his work. He more or less defined the design aesthetic of the 80s, the 1980s. He did the cover for Duran Duran's Rio album. I did a lot of work for Playboy. Real popular in the 90s at poster stores where you would have these these rather beautiful women with just flat white like snow white skin and very, very flat, dark hair. That's, that was the inspiration. I was a big fan of Nagel's work. I had his, his art book that came out in the late eighties, unfortunately, after, after his death. And I have several of his posters still hanging up today. I can absolutely uh, see, was, I can absolutely see why this is an appeal for a fantasy race. Like 100%. I see what you're doing. That's, that's actually really yep. cool now that I see where that came from. And it was it was two different ideas. It was like I want to I want to make a fantasy race that looks like a Patrick Nagel uh, a drawing, and I had this idea for twins, so I just combined them. <laughs> it, it absolutely works for that concept too, because you know these two, mm-hmm. a lot of his works when you drain them of all of that, a, a lot of the the tertiary details and re- render them a, a pale white, they all kind of look like they could be the same person. Yeah, yeah, and they're they're it's it's almost a generic sort of face. That, that, that he draws and that was that was part of the appeal you know and and a lot of times it would like like the the no nose thing when they when when he would draw them straight on it was almost very little detail so it's just like a couple of little nostrils and that's it so i just kind of ran with that and used that as my inspiration and it's so fascinating seeing the different ways that's been handled <laughs> wow <laughs> yeah yeah Matter of fact, when I, I, I did a, a search tonight for years, I noticed there was another homebrew version on there with their own art, which they made them look almost like halflings, but they still had kind of the white, you know, that 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 snow white skin and the and the super dark hair. And I was like, well, at least they they, they kept the the visual concept. <laughs> yeah, fascinating. <laughs> It's really it's really interesting because I am not at all an artist, right? I work with a lot of artists and I, you know, have to kind of make sure that, you know, they're making cool stuff. But I actually give them a lot of free reign on on, you know, the way their art ends up uh, developing, mm-hmm. and, you know, what designs mm-hmm. they end up picking. So it's really interesting yeah. for me to see uh, both what your original inspiration was for that and the way other people who have never, you know, had contact with you and, you know, just through the, the different places this 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 race has shown up, like interpret uh, interpreted it. It's. You know, this conversation is really interesting because it's taking place across 30 years of D&D and we're on opposite. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's fascinating to me. That's one of the things that that drove me to make this particular podcast. And one of the reasons that I thought, even though Devadi are not in in the sense that Dungeons and Dragons uses the term a monster, that mm-hmm. it would be really important. To, that it would be really cool to have this conversation. Rarely do I get the chance to talk about monsters across editions with the people who made them yeah. and always always little things like this are coded into the monster and then we play a game of telephone with it down through the editions or the generations of players yeah some stuff sticks some stuff doesn't well you know you you create certain themes and as long as those themes are kept then i think you you, you keep the creature in in focus i guess you you, you keep it cohesive. It's the same creature, even if the details are different, even if the systems are different. As long as you you, you keep that theme to it, then it, it's it's close enough that it still feels like the same thing. What do you think are the most important themes for this one? Oh, certainly the the whole soul thing. To me, that's the heart of it. The fact that they are literally one soul. Different. That's what differentiates them between a set of human twins. Human twins are, you know, presumably two different souls, and and that makes them each an individual. Whereas this is literally a single person 
that has been divided into two people, two, two entities, which is a very difficult concept for us to wrap our heads around because, you know, we're, we're such individuals that, you know, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure, Mike, as a twin, you can you can tell me that there are you do. You are a separate person. Oh, oh I mean, absolutely. You know, me and my brother also couldn't be any more different if we tried, but it's, <laughs> it's just interesting, you know, cause that idea absolutely resonates with me. Right. I, I think you, you, if you are a twin, you grow up uh, a lot thinking about, you know, kind of what that means as far as individuality goes. And, and, you know, cause mm-hmm. you know, th- you don't think about like all of the little things that go into being a twin, like, Oh, we're not just the same age and grow up at the same house and have the same birthday, but we're also often in the same classroom sitting next to each other. Yeah. And yeah. you know, you're like stuck next to a person for a long time. So you, and who, who probably got the same haircut and is wearing clothes that are bought from the same store. You end up, you, you grapple a lot with identity when you're growing up. And, you know, yeah. I, I think I discovered the Devadi when I was, you know, in college and out on my own and everything. But these ideas still echo around. And I mean, it's a powerful idea. It's why I grappled onto it. And someone is probably going to glom onto this in the future whenever sixth and seventh editions come out, right? It's a, it's a really, <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> it's inevitable. Inevitable. <laughs> Well, you know, and, and and that's that is very interesting because the uh, I think some of my motivation for 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 creating them was an interest in what it would be like to be a twin. As a visual, as an artist, I'm a very very visual person, right? And I I tend to think with my eyes, which is a stupid thing to say, but you know, it's it's <laughs> it's what things look like is is kind of the first thing I go to. And when I have been confronted with with sets of twins over over my my life, and not very often, they are pretty pretty rare. But you know, it, my brain has trouble accepting that they are different people, especially when they're kids and they dress alike. You know, um, I went to uh, I, I went to private school. We all had to wear uniforms, and there was a, a set of uh, girls, sisters, uh, twin sisters, who were a, a, a grade below me. So I didn't I didn't personally know them, but I saw them in the hallway. And because we all had to wear the same uniform, they had to style their hair differently in order to – so people could tell them apart. And like one would wear a ponytail on the right, one would wear a ponytail on the left, and it was up to you to remember which was which. <laughs> and my brain just – I could not wrap my head around that. And it's like every time I saw them, I was like, it's the same person. No, it's not. <laughs> but that was what kind of stuck with me. And, and and I think that's where the sort of devotee germinated was that idea was that, you know, what if they weren't different people? What if they really were the same person? <laughs> shows, yeah, it shows like uh, Orphan Black, great show, loved that show because it dealt with some, a lot of those same ideas. You know, they're clones. They're the same, the same actress playing the same part. They look the same. They act a little bit the same, but they're all slightly different and different in very dramatic ways. And I, I, I really liked that. You know what I think one of the strongest things that that the class approach is talking about is also the nature of how you play Dungeons and Dragons. Like everyone Mm -hmm. knows, I shouldn't say everyone, but most people know um, about the origin of Dungeons and Dragons is, you know, it's split off from war games in which you play, you know, uh, you move around entire squads or you play as an entire squad. And then D&D's radical move was saying each of you plays one character. And and the Devadi almost feel like uh, part of our reflexive urge to to challenge that to say, <laughs> okay, but what if I what if I do play multiple characters? How does that start changing dynamics? <laughs> it's a really yeah, it's, it's something that's always going to be there because it's something that's that's an inherent challenge to to something that's fundamental to the system mm-hmm. that we're playing. It. It's, it's extremely interesting. I, I, that's why I think it's going to be around for a long time. It's that's one of yeah. the things that grabs me about it, and it'll probably it'll be interesting to see if Wizards of the Coast remembers this specific interpretation <laughs> of that or if they try something else right but, you know a, a number of years ago i think when fourth edition was out i was interested in developing a, an official version for pathfinder so i i sent them an email and was like you know i'm the guy who originally wrote it and i would very much like to you know be interested in in buying the rights back or you know licensing the rights from you to create a pathfinder version would you guys be interested and they came back and said no no we're not um, it's not for sale as we would say it's not for licensing you can't have it that's so- and, and I understood. I'm like, okay, that's that's fine. And it occurred to me later, it was like I probably shouldn't have mentioned Pathfinder, because Pathfinder was really big at the time and was their biggest competition, and they weren't doing so great with Fourth Ed. And I was like, that was probably my mistake right who, there. Who currently um, owns the rights? Is it's it the Wizards. Code? Oh yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because that was that was part of the fine print of the contest. Anything that you submitted to them as part of the contest became their intellectual property, so, whether whether it won or not. 
Fascinating. Oh, wow. That that yeah. feels very Wizards of the Coast. Yeah, one of the things I'm working on right now <laughs> is just a massive kind of expansion book for D&D 5th edition. We've got mm-hmm. 10 base classes and 70-something subclasses in Ooh, one book. Wow. It's going to be... Okay. I'm, I'm, I really want to push this thing as like a real like game changer and yeah. everything has been kind of developed over the course of five years or so. so it's a lot of stuff and i'm finalizing mm-hmm. the race list right now and it's really disappointing to know that i'd have to go you know beg with <laughs> wizards of the coast to get the Devadi because i actually do you know I, i'd love to put yeah. my, my version in it but um, yeah i'd i'd love to see that too oh, but I, yeah, I, do have one, I have a couple of friends who work at wizards of the coast now i could ask them but I don't well, you know there. try <laughs> try absolutely i would i would love to see them out there i was thinking about kind of reapproaching it myself and 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 doing a fifth edition version after we see how popular the the pathfinder version i'd is. love to see how your version differs um, from mine i really would that'd be extremely that would be okay. fascinating i'm working on it with a with a guy named walter walter Shem, shamu Shamo, Shamo. I, I, I promised I wouldn't call him Shamu, and I did anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was, and and he was the one who originally developed it for uh, for Pathfinder and put it on the. It's not Paizo's forum because they don't have a forum anymore. I guess it, it might be under Giants in the Playground or something. It's one of those one of those forum sites. Oh yeah. And they've been talking about it back and forth for years, and it finally apparently just occurred to him to come to me uh, with some questions, and we just started talking back and forth over email, and I ended up sort of kind of going well this is how i would do it well no this is how i would do that this is how i would do that let's just develop the damn thing (laughs) so you know i i recently put forth a a, based on our discussion a draft and sent that to him and he came back with a whole bunch of notes and i've yet to implement (laughs) his notes into my draft which is so we're just kind of going back and forth on it i'm hoping maybe by summer uh, i'll have it actually ready with some new art i'm going to publish it as if it were a, a commercial product but just release it for free um, yeah that's, that's so cool it's gonna it's awesome to hear <laughs> that you're still you're still you know taking this and, and running with it right you know so many of the things you know back from dragon magazine mm-hmm. that i could dig my fingers into and you know you know really came away with something where i was like yeah this is really cool and they never did much with it you know i i'm the only person to have really you know resurrected some of that stuff so that you know my players and uh, you know readers can enjoy it so it's it's ex- extremely exciting to hear that you're still like fiddling with these and, and trying to trying to make sure they're around and i'm i'm excited as hell that there are still people out there who who remember it and and love it i mean you know this was one page in a dragon magazine 20 some odd years ago i never thought it would it would stick i mean i never thought people would still be talking about it all these years later uh, and i was absolutely blown over when paizo included it in their their compendium i mean they took 20 years of material themselves and picked with their favorite things. And my thing, which didn't even win the contest. It was second place, <laughs> second place. And of course the creature that did win was absolutely freaking fantastic. I mean, I can't believe no one's done anything. Do you remember it. what it was? Uh, it was like a, it's on the, you got the dragon magazine in front of you. It was on the, it was on the, 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 the page prior to it. It's a, a, a wraithy sort of undead thing. I, I do not remember the details of it now. It's been years since I looked at it, but uh-huh. I remember reading it going, okay, yeah, this, this deserves to win. <laughs> yeah, that <one> <laughs> I was like, I was like second place. Oh, oh, uh-huh. oh yeah. No, 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 that's good. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, I was flattered as hell that it, that it, that it, that it won second place back in the day. And I'm flattered as hell that, 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 that Paizo chose it for their book. And I'm, I'm flattered as hell that people are still talking about it all these years later. And I'm flattered as hell that you you made a version for it for 5e, and it's and I love that it's 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 good. I mean, I was like, oh god, this is going to be terrible, <laughs> but no, it's it was great. I'm like, oh oh yeah. I, it. yeah. I try not to make terrible things. There's a lot of that going around. <laughs> yeah, a little too much. Yeah, yeah. No, the the uh, I I have to say the only issue I had with it was the art, which it was very good. But they were fraternal. And I'm like, ah, I, had, I had no idea what to find. It was it was like you, you kind of dig back through the Pathfinder stuff. And I really wanted to, you know, that wasn't even like my first pick. And that was back when, you know, before I had a team of artists uh, that I could work with in commission for everything. Mm, so yeah. I, I, found, I found something to fit it. And it was it was a tough pick because I in my in my conception, I really wanted them to be uh, more like humans. I think that you know, it was a little bit more efficient in terms of driving at the point because I figured mm-hmm. some people want to play Devadi elves, some people want to play Devadi dwarves. They really want to, they want to really want to conceptualize them in different ways. So I just kind of set it as a 
clean human middle ground oh. let them mess with it how they want that yeah. seems like the neater uh, direction to take it couldn't find art that fit that so pff, yeah okay, i found something well that's that's an interesting idea which is something else i hadn't hadn't really considered is is yeah what if this was just a magical twin quote unquote thing and not uh, not a specific race that's that's an interesting approach surely there are twin dwarves too like yeah yeah you know. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's where I came in. I, I heard Brennan Lee Mulligan of Dimension Twenty say something that I thought was really interesting. He said the only thing you're beholden to in the game is the numbers, and anything else that you want it to decide to be is up to you. You can replace the flavor text any way you want. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I think that's what you're getting at with with this with this option. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, if you've made it this far, thanks for listening. I just wanted to let you know the next 11 minutes or so of the podcast will be my campaign story from playing a pair of Devati twins. So if that's not your thing, skip forward to hear how you can get more from my guests on the show. We'll get into how game design is done and some of the most rewarding experiences that it can provide and how people can still surprise you with the things that they do with the things that you make. So if all of that is your thing, stick around. And uh, by the way, don't forget to check out the show's Patreon page for awesome perks and early content at patreon.com slash scintilla studio. Next week's episode is already live for patrons at the $1 a month tier. I call them goblins. I think that's the whole story. Do you guys want to hear how it went for me? Absolutely. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, because I've I've ever never actually interacted with people who have played any of my stuff before. <laughs> so please lay it on me. Back in summer 2018, I started this. I started playing this game with these two twins, and it was as far as character introductions go. I think it was one of my favorites because I introduced them one at a time, and then it took took the the party a while to get round to the fact that these were two of the same like the same person. Oh, um, interesting. I cast them as the Bard College of Swords, which opened up a whole lot of flavor for me as far as them being able to perform together in stage combat as well as harmonizing with themselves. And in order to render that at the table, to be able to manage this as players, we had to decide like early on, how do I know which one I'm talking to. So I had a slightly different voice that I did for the one versus the other. Hmm. But the best part about it was I could at any point, of course, I gave them alliterative names. So it was uh, Mason and Mathis, the Wind Reaver <laughs> twins. Nice. Uh, at any point in the game, I could say, oh, no, that's Mathis. Or <laughs> you got it wrong. So, that is awesome. But I built... Just looking at some of the things that I was given by by Mike's race options, two of the things that stood out best were one was empathic link, the idea that these two are not telepathic, mm-hmm. they're just nearly so. Mm-hmm. I think the way you wrote it, Mike, was Devati, t- Devati twins can communicate with half the words and twice the speed of other creatures, even in combat, which is, you know, it didn't come up much, but it was kind of a neat inversion of Thieves' Cant, where you take twice as much time to say half as many things but it's completely incomprehensible mm-hmm. that the is other interesting. Thing, yeah the other thing that i used a lot was transference this trait you wrote was that if one of your devotee twins is affected by a curse or disease or is blinded deafened paralyzed or poisoned, and the other is not you can use your action to transfer that condition to the other twin so if you have one on the front lines, as a Bard College of Swords might be, and one in the back slinging your concentration spells, you could switch the blindness or the deafness forward or backward to one or the other. Yeah. And that, that's that's something that's uh, a little different, at least so far, for the with the Pathfinder version, because I've really embraced the, the one character sort of thing. So what affects one affects the other. That was tough for me to deal with, because in, in my original uh, conception, I was thinking about how that affects certain magical effects that are like, you know, a character being poisoned or something like that. Well, actually, poisoned is one of the easy ones to, to talk about, right? Mm-hmm. But That's true, because they it, are physical. Right. There are certain conditions in the game that it, it, it was harder for me to justify, which, yeah. which was one of the driving aspects of, of, and this might be different in Pathfinder too. I don't know that system as well as 5th edition. It was hard for me to justify those conditions affecting two people when only one of them is 
you know, you know, actively blinded by, you know, mm -hmm. acid thrown on their face or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 there were the, there were a couple of features from the original Devati that I kind of had to get rid of just for space because mm -hmm. boy, this thing gets long. Things like echo attack and uh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and we're and finding I, places for those. That's good. That's uh, fantastic. Not, I, I I just got to a point where I was like, okay, I can do yeah. some of these things, but I can't do all of them. So I'm gonna, yep. I'm gonna lock down some some <laughs> transparent stuff and uh, call it. Yeah, yeah. And that's exactly where we are in the process. Is that, you know our version is way too long and complicated. So we're now yeah. going, okay. What can we turn into a feat? What can we turn into an alternate ability? You know that sort of thing. What what is core to the race and what is extraneous to the race? And that was. I think that's that's you had to go through the same process. I'm sure it's the, it's the hardest part of design. Absolutely, the, it's the place where you take a knife to the thing that you love and yep. start hacking it apart. <laughs> and it's yeah. I mean it's it's the big difficult thing about design. It's where you make your money, really. Uh, well, I'm glad you kept that one good. in in the way that I had written the backstory for these twins. It that was the ability that would first tell their family that there was something different about them. That as spiteful children, they kept trading the same cold back and forth. <laughs> That's so good. That's so good. Oh my god. That's so much better than something I could have written. Uh. Oh man. I'll tell you I'll save you the part in the middle where of course they were extremely heroic and extremely flamboyant and and I got to do just every game breaking thing under the sun at the table. But the there is an end to this story because I have been playing them for two years and it ends as most characters do with a dragon. I thought that with my two still extremely fragile halves of my character that maybe the safest place for one of them was right on the dragon's back. And I, I pulled some shenanigans. Of course, we're fighting in a volcano and of course, lava continues to be one of the most terrifying things in the game. Yeah. Um, it should be. The College of Swords has an ability where if you hit with a weapon attack, you can push your target up to 15 feet away from you. No save necessary. The College of Swords gets only three fighter maneuvers, basically, but they're all a doozy. And that was the one using the, you know, the most power. I think I had this the spell Shadow Blade active at the moment. Let's be honest. I had Shadow Blade. I remember every detail of this fight. Um, <laughs> so it was like, all right, this is this big heckin' sword, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna roll a crit. I, I made a critical hit on this attack. I said, can I push it through the floor down to the lava? And my DM said, yes. Do you have any way of getting off its back? <laughs> and I said, no. No. <laughs> and we went to a private chat. <laughs> and uh, we came back and we told the rest of the group that, yeah, you know, we, we did the whole like 10, 15, 20 minutes of reading the rules about falling and trying to figure it out. And it became clear there was no way we could justify one of these twins not going down with the ship. Hmm. Mike, the way you wrote what happens when this happens mm -hmm. is that when yeah. one of the twins is reduced to zero hit points and begins to make death savings throws, its other twin becomes incapacitated, able to move at only half speed. If a devotee twin dies, the other twin quickly begins to deteriorate and perishes 24 hours later if his partner does not return to life. A couple of things. One that a couple of things that lava takes away from you. One is death saving throws. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the other is a body. Yeah. <laughs> which is kind of important for a lot of resurrections. I wrote this knowing how brutal it would be. Like, <laughs> you know, we, uh, I'll tell you, I'll give you this as a player and as a designer, we thought it was fair. Like I had been in two places at once for years and it's like, it's bonkers. And we all like, well, this is, if this is how it's going to be, then this is the trade-off. Brutal that you have 24 hours in character. Yeah. To, yeah. To, to oh. say your goodbyes and to, to go <laughs> and that's that's hard like it's one thing for somebody to be you know you know dropped in lava at the climactic battle with the dragon it's another one to slowly say goodbye to a friend and i i wrote this knowing that, that knowing that that's what it was uh, it's it's still extremely painful to hear it <laughs> yeah well maybe less so because i i kind of cheated a little bit <laughs> 
Bards have an ability called Magical Secrets that lets them take spells from anybody's list that they want. It's one of the many ways in which Bards sort of extend a certain finger to the rest of the class schema. <laughs> and uh, I took Reincarnate. It was my ripcord. For if ever this race became too broken or too annoying or not fun, that was oh, my... that's interesting. That was my concession to the DM. For years, I had a fifth level spell slot that I did not use. Huh. So instead of dying and instead of being incapacitated with, I mean, I mean fully, fully through this like debilitating, mind breaking, physically defeating loss mm -hmm. with the help of extremely powerful spellcasters that surrounded him, they performed this massive ritual that costs a king's ransom in <laughs> spell components and reincarnated this massive two-person soul into one body. Reincarnate makes you roll for what you will be next. I ended yeah. up rolling as a high elf. That's fitting. I thought so. Yeah. There are a couple of questions that that gives me. One is that he now has a few more centuries to live than he would otherwise have. Yeah. So what do you do with that time? Yeah. <laughs> the other thing is spell wrought, though it may be, how does this one body hold a soul big enough for two people? <laughs> and what are the consequences there? And that's where we are. Reincarnation is a, yeah, that's a, that's a, uh, that's an option I had not considered. And, and that's always going to happen when you're, when you're dealing with, with gaming, there's always an option that somebody's going to come up with that <laughs> you didn't consider that makes you kind of go up. That's, that's fantastic. It's, yeah, it's yeah. one of the, uh, this is what I designed for. <laughs> like this is yeah. it, it really is phenomenal uh, to see this stuff echo around and, and find more life and more creativity than I could have put it, put into it. Uh, that's, that's phenomenal. <laughs> well, we're just about at an hour. Um, before we go, uh, I would love to give you guys space to tell people how to follow you guys, the, the work that you're doing uh, and any projects that you might like them to be a part of going forward. So uh, Mike, yeah, you can find me at magehandpress.com where we publish stuff every week. We've got a Patreon and we'll be running one or two Kickstarters this year for more 5e content and uh, stuff that's not 5e content that we'll keep secret for now. And uh, yeah, that's where you can find me. Talent? Well, I'm I'm mostly on I'm on Facebook and I have I have a website. It's it's currently Talent Art dot my portfolio dot com uh, i'm also on deviant art under the name everhu i also uh, publish under the name fantastic gallery which is on drive through rpg uh, and then i've written a few of my own books and uh, yeah so it's all print on demand it's good times uh we're, we're actually i've been working on a modern version of pathfinder for a long time and we were just about finished with it before they announced second edition and sort of pulled the rug out from the whole thing. <laughs> so, you know, I've been kind of sitting on it ever since, waiting on the, the edition. Uh, well, it's not an edition war. It's more like, you know, where the fan's going to settle. And it seems to be just kind of 50-50. So I, I haven't really decided how I want to proceed yet. But that's a big project. That's going to be my biggest book ever, big hardcover book. So Great. If, I, if I can ever get that done. Yeah. That's exciting. It's Have you hardcover. ever made a big hardcover book before? No, this is this is the first time um, I've ever written anything that big. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys are you guys are kind of going through that right now, aren't you? So yeah, I've done a couple. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, it's I'm I'm really really proud of what we did. I think it's a, a, a really really great alternative Pathfinder system, and it's it's going to be called uh, it's the uh, the Modern Path 3.0. I actually got the rights from uh, somebody else who had made versions one and two, and he sold me the rights. And, so I'm making a third edition. It's going to be awesome. Great. If any part of the story of the Wind Reaver twins resonated with you and you want to support the show, you can pick up the Paladin Oath of Duality on dmsguild.com. It's a subclass I wrote that combines everything great about the push and pull of the Devadi twins on the world and the system around them. And it's much less challenging to play than the Devadi race option. You'll find links to everything in this episode on the show's website at scintilla.studio slash monster. That's S-C-I-N-T-I-L-L-A dot studio slash 
monster. And don't forget to check out the show's Patreon page for awesome perks and early content at patreon.com slash scintilla studio. Next week's episode is already live for patrons at the $1 a month level. I call them goblins. I'll see you guys next week.